Uh, I'm Steely Glint on Twitter, and feel free to tweet at me. I'm going to have to dash off after this, but I will be around later. So um, tweet at me if you've got want to get in contact. So WebRTC, what is it? Um, I, brutally, it's about $60 million uh, worth of intellectual property that Google bought and then put into the public domain um, as, as open source. And you, as a result of that, they kicked off um, this development. I mean, there are other players involved, and you see at the bottom of the slide, but, but I think Google do need to be given credit for kicking this off. Um, so what is it? Um, it's the ability to add real-time voice and video to a website. So I've been going on, some of you may have seen me talk about this kind of stuff before, I've been going on about how the web is too silent, how it's not, you know, doesn't support our best means of communication, which is speech. We're all really good at speech, and the web just doesn't support that um, very well. And this is the first time that it's going to be done properly. Um, and I can say that. So it, it is... The other definition of it is that it's a pair of standards from the W3C and the IETF. So the W3C are defining an HTML5 API in JavaScript for it, and the IETF are defining the wire protocol um, and the low-level security stuff that defines what this is. So it is a real standard. If it's not some ad hoc thing, um, the standards bodies are working on it and are producing a, a real, real thing. Um, it's in Chrome right now. If you have a Chrome browser, you have it in there. Uh, if you're running the current release, it's not enabled with a single flag and you can click it on. Um, within about five weeks, it will be by default, it will be on. Firefox, it's in the nightly builds, it's not in the production release yet. Gossip is that it will be in IE. When is not clear, but it will be in IE. Um, Safari, we have absolutely no idea. Apple don't, um, don't say, that's traditionally they never have. They've got a good track record of adopting um, W3C standards, so there's a good chance they will adopt it, but that's by no means a certainty. And the other players in the, in, in, in the standards body include people like Cisco and Ericsson and Skype. So it's not a little obscure thing. Really serious players are behind it. And the key thing is there are no plugins. Right? This is part of the browser. It's built into the browser. We're not using Flash. We're not using Java. We're not using ActiveX. And it's a standard API, so once the thing's settled, you'll be able to rely on it being in every browser. Um, and it will be, hopefully, compatible. In the same way that browsers are always a little bit edgy, but um, pretty much you should be able to rely on that API being there. And it can leverage, because it's built in, and built in particularly, it can leverage the resources of the machine, and, and so if there's echo cancellation built into the hardware, it can take advantage of that in a way that Flash always struggled to do, and, and video accelerators and stuff like that. Um, and the other thing that's different about it, and it doesn't really belong on this slide, but I wanted to mention it somewhere, so I kind of snuck it in. Um, it's encrypted P2P. So it's not, there's, there's the whole, there's some quite interesting aspects to it in that the calls are by default encrypted, and by default, they're point, they're point to point, browser to browser or browser to gateway. And they're using ICE and SRTP. <coughs> so some fairly advanced telephony standards are used as the default underpinnings of this. Um, so having said what it is, I want to say what it isn't. It isn't just a phone box on the web. I've done that and it doesn't work. Um, it technically works, but you know, this is something different. It, this is a T.S. Eliot quote um, from Journey of the Magi. He says that he'd seen birth and death, and he thought that they were different. And this is this is both of those. This is both um, a an undermining of some of the existing things and a replacement of them with something that's different and better. It's it is, in my view, a new beginning. Voice on the web is a is a major thing, I think, and video. So, if you're going to do this, you need to adopt web thinking. If you're going to use calls in the web, you have to start thinking about them from the user's standpoint. And the user is sitting in front of a web browser and has a set of web-based expectations, web models in their heads. And you have to carry that through. If you're going to use WebRTC, you need to do this. Um, 
So you can't build by the minute on the web. Nobody has successfully built by the minute on the web, and I don't believe anyone ever will. Um, almost all the transactions on the web are asynchronous, and that doesn't map very well to synchronous calling. So you have to think about how that, um, how that should be modeled, how that should be done. Um, and identities on the web are context dependent. It's not like your phone, which is a single number. Um, it, you know, when I log into Facebook, my identity is different from when I log into a, a, a poker site. Um, or when I log into LinkedIn, I'm, my identity is different. So the identities on the web are context dependent. And if you're building WebRTC into your products, you need to think about that, because people expect that to be um, malleable in that way, because it's on the web. And the web isn't always on. So you can't assume that people will have a browser open 24-7 in the way that you can assume that they will have a phone switched on for the majority of the day. So it's a different dynamic. You have to think about the user experience if you're going to put, put calls onto a web browser. Um, and the other thing that's fundamentally different, and this, this goes all the way through, is that the, um, the web is used to having a dynamically loadable client interface. So what you, the way that a given web page behaves, so the way that the LinkedIn page behaves, is different from the way that a Facebook page behaves. So you need to be aware of that and build, and each page will have its own interface and its own feel. Um, and you need to think about how that should behave. And the other fundamental of the web is that browsing to evil.com should be safe. So you have to think about what that means in terms of your um, WebRTC standpoint, and that has a whole lot of impacts right down onto the um, protocols that have been used. So you know the SRTP and the ICE things are in there precisely to make browsing to an evil website relatively safe. Um, so it isn't the same as the Digium phone or the Polycom phone on your desk, because they have a fixed set of firmware and a fixed set of behaviors. And if you look at these, these last two items, they mean that your, your web browser has neither of those things. And you need to think about that as part of your, your strategy for uh, taking on WebRTC. So, but why would you do it anyway? I mean, what's the, why would you, if I'm saying it's not a phone box on the web, what is it? What makes it worth doing? And the answer is user benefits. You have to build a user benefit into your, into your app that makes it worth the person's while to click the button to make the call. And those benefits are generally around tying in the other assets of your web presence. So things like um, the context. So, you know, you already know that this person's navigated halfway through your support pages before they make the call. And maybe you could feed that into the call such that when they get through to the agent, the agent knows all that. So that kind of context. They may have logged in and they may have a support identity. And you may know that at that point that they're one of your best customers. So you might route the call differently based on that. So the identity is important. Conversely, if you're a recruitment site, you might want to guarantee a level of anonymity in the call such that the first touch of that recruitment or dating site is anonymous so that people feel comfortable getting started and then maybe they'll start revealing more when they choose to. Um, and then there's a the whole business about permissioning and rendezvous. I don't know about you, but there are very few people from whom I accept spontaneous phone calls gladly. Generally, I expect to have a negotiation with them about when they're going to call me and under what circumstances. I mean, you know, um, there are people who I will take a call from out of the blue, but it's a limited set, and it's a limited set of circumstances. So you need to think about how that rendezvous could be constructed. And to and if the website aids in that, then you can get a much better user experience. So there's a genuine user benefit from having maybe a negotiation over, um, over a Facebook page, or over a LinkedIn page, or over your app. Um, to the point where you decide that a call is worth it, that, that you and the recipient of the call have decided that this call is worth having because the thing has got too complicated to do in text or it genuinely needs voice to explain itself. Um, so, slight shift of gears here, but one of the ways that you can start doing, um, getting your hands on to WebRTC's Phono, which is a project I work on, it's a free open source jQuery plugin which allows you to embed um, a SIP call into your website. 
Um, the aim is to make that as simple as possible. So if you're a, if you've got a jQuery capable web programmer, they should be able to do this without any problem. Um, we also have a, a native layer for the mobile platforms. Um, if you if you want to build an iPhone app or, or, or an Android app, then we have a native layer for that as well. Again, that's open source. Um, and as a, um, it includes an XMPP-based messaging um, section. And we finally got to the point where we've got an echo canceller available on all platforms if the hardware supports it. So you actually, you know, you can plunk down your iPad and talk to it and listen to it without having to kind of find a pair of headphones or something like that. So what the, the nice thing about Phono and the means the way that it means you can get started right now is that it's um, it has multiple backends. I mean, obviously WebRTC is the future backend, but for the moment, if you're on Safari or IE or something, then you can fall back to using the Flash backend, and you get a reasonable result. Not as good as with WebRTC, but but you'll get a reasonable result. Um, and um, on, on iOS and Android, we have a PhoneGap plugin, um, which allows you to build an app based on HTML5 and Phono and use that. And then as I said, on the um, mobile platforms, we also have um, native for uh, in Java and for uh, Objective-C for iOS. So this is, a, this is the simplest possible Phono call. It's, as soon as you open a page with this in it, it will make a phone call to this app. Um, so it can be a SIP address, or in this case it's a Tropo app, which is one of the other products I, I work on, um, which is a cloud-based um, telephony platform. And messaging is equally simple. And this is, a, this is an interesting example. It's actually, don't do this, because it's a bit <laughs> risky. But what I've done is um, it evolves the incoming message. Right. So the incoming message can have a piece of JavaScript which says, change the page to green, or change the sort order. Um, and when we're, when we're done, I could do a or, or, you know, Whatever, but but the so you need to you need to validate what that message is. But the point is that you can make the page interactive by sending a message back up um, from the IVR or from the from the back end. Uh, fingers crossed, I may demonstrate that later. So um, at this point, I'm going to switch presentations, and Josh Colt from Digium is going to talk about where asterisk is in, in this um, picture. And then, yeah. with any luck, we'll do a demo at the end, maybe. Everyone cross their fingers for the eventual demo. <laughs> um, so yeah, Tim has talked about WebRTC in general some, but I'm going to focus on what asterisk can now do as of asterisk 11 with uh, WebRTC and some possible applications <coughs> that may occur in the future. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd just like to introduce myself a little bit. So. It might be easier for some of you to come approach me if you have questions later. Um, I'm a Canadian, hail from Atlantic Canada. Yes, James just said uh, he finally realized. Uh, I've been doing asterisk development for quite a while, seven plus years. I once tried to figure out how long, but I lost track, really. 